Hello, Coast Hills and friends, and welcome to another online service here at Coast Hills Community Church, where we aspire to be a Jesus-centered community, creating gracious space through acts of generous love. And we are here in the kitchen where we're hoping that we're cooking up some good soul food for you. My name's Kevin. Really happy to be here. We've actively been participating as a church uh, the Lenten season, which is a time of intentionally, um, a time to intentionally prepare for Easter. And uh, today marks the last Sunday in Lent and then prepares us for the Passion Week, which is the story of Jesus the week before Good Friday and ultimately Easter Sunday. I want to encourage you um, to join us uh, on Good Friday. We're doing a ministerial, a joint Cloverdale Church uh, live gathering at Pacific Community Church or you can watch that online, so you can be a part of that as well, and then celebrate with us at A.G. McClellan Elementary School. We're gonna start at 10.30 sharp, because we wanna be done at 11.45, because then we're also then, that, that service is gonna be uh, chock full of um, just celebrating uh, how good God is and what he's done in, through the resurrection of, of Jesus on Easter. And then we've invited the community to join us for a hot dog uh, barbecue lunch as well as um, an Easter egg hunt. So uh, all the details are on our website. Hope you're able to join us uh, for those. We're going to today lo be looking at John 12. Uh, we're going to look at John 12, 1 to 19. Um, the Palm Sunday passage will be <clears throat> the last half of it, but I, I thought I'd choose John 12, uh, 1 to 19, because it's, it's also going to talk about Jesus being anointed at Bethany. It is smack dab in the middle of what we talked about last week, not on our online, but in person, where um, it was the, the raising of Lazarus, and then um, uh, Palm Sunday, and right in the middle is Jesus being anointed at Bethany. And it, it's going to see, hopefully we're gonna see the significance of that. Um, so why don't we get started? We hope that this, uh, today, this service, um, this teaching will both um, encourage you as well as challenge you and hopefully uh, reveal a little bit more clearly who Jesus is. Let's read John 12, verses 1 to 19. I'm reading from the New International Version. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus um, uh, was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume she poured on Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was, who were to, was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages, he said. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he was the treasurer, he used uh, to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for this day of my burial. 
You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Now, um, the story about Palm Sunday. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. And my question is, what kind of king is Jesus coming as? What kind of king is Jesus? Verse 12. The next day, the great crowd, a great crowd had come for the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, save us! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. And as it was written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had to be written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed that sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Okay, so there is a lot going on in, in this passage um, and hopefully what we want to be able to look at t- today uh, is asking that question, who is this king riding in to Jerusalem? It's almost like we ask that question at Christmas time, what child is this? Who, who, who is this child? You see, Jesus is always going to um, break or challenge our assumptions of who we think he is. And today, I don't think it's going to be any different. See, Jesus is the Messiah. And this term Messiah simply means the anointed one. It's also then uh, a name given to uh, a, a king. The, the, the anointed one, one is given, who's been given um, the authority uh, by God um, to rule and reign. And so here is Jesus, the Messiah. The king. And where is this king anointed before he rides into Jerusalem? Well, this king is anointed at Bethany. Now, if you weren't with us in the live service last, last week, we looked at the fact that um, the word Bethany, the town Bethany, means house of misery. It also means house of figs. <laughs> But there's also this meaning of house of misery or house of the poor. In fact, N.T. Wright, uh, Bible scholar, says this, Bethany means literally the house of the poor or the house of misery. There is some evidence that it was just that, a place where the sick, the poor, and the needy who would be need of care for, a kind of hospice, a little way outside of the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus is anointed there. He's not anointed in Jerusalem, where all the crowds of the would be and the uh, uh, all the crowds of the not the would bees, but the, all the important people would be. No, he's anointed at Bethany at the house of misery. Now let's remember that Jesus' first sermon, which Luke records for us, was reciting and reading Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and then claiming that he was the fulfillment of that scripture. It says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And it goes on, and then Jesus finishes reading that script. And he says, To bring the, Lord, the, the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls up the scroll, sits down, 
And he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. What he's saying is that he's the anointed one. The anointed one to bring what? Good news to the poor, to the broken, to the blind, to the imprisoned. Bring freedom. And here, he is anointed now at Bethany. Now, obviously, his, his, his feet here are anointed and anointed with um, expensive perfume. It's, it's, it's a beautiful moment when we think nothing can come out of that house of misery. Nothing can come out of the house of the poor. Nothing can come out of that place that's any good. Here we have Mary who then dumps a jar of perfume that, that the, the equivalent is a year's wage. It, he said that it, it would, average wage was then was about 100 denarii per, uh, for a person. And that jar was worth just over 300 denarii. So there's this beautiful like extravagance that's coming out of the place or the house of misery. That should make us pause about who this king is. The Messiah being anointed at the house of the poor. Just before he's a, he is to make his grand entrance to the capital city for an ins insurrection, <laughs> a takeover. But the way that Jesus approaches Jerusalem just after being anointed at Bethany, gives us a hint of who this king is and what he is about and how he is going to rule and reign. See, there's a symbol that they, they use. They, uh, uh, people grabbed palm branches, which is uh, something that would have been had access to them. We were talking about in the live service, we don't really, we won't have palm branches, but I wonder if we use cedar boughs. Um, but they used what was, what was there for them, but they could have grabbed other branches too, but John specifically says palm branches. Now, <clears throat> waving palm branches was a bit of a tradition, and, and waving palm branches uh, would have been um, their uh, interpretation of who Jesus is, that he was a Messiah uh, that was to come to rule and reign and to bring a new era uh, and, and to save them from the Roman rule at the time. Um, one scholar says this, on the 20, and, and he's quoting Maccabees here, uh, it is in, sorry, 1 Maccabee 13, um, 51 says this, on the 23rd day of the second month, in, in the 171st year, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches, and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. He's speaking about when the Maccabees rode into Jerusalem at that time. And he would have been riding, not on a donkey, but on a war horse, and the people were waving palm branches. Um, there's also uh, this, uh, another Jewish uh, book called the, the Testament of uh, Naph Naphtala, another book written by the Jews in that period, uh, also discussed palm branches in the context of messianic expectation. And so these palm branches were a symbol that the people used um, when Jesus entered Jerusalem. And people used them to interpret his identity. Yes, you are the Messiah. So they're agreeing with who Jesus is. And they were hoping for the long hope for a king that would drive out the Gentiles uh, and would come with military might. So these palm branches uh, they were waving uh, were the expectation of a victory by this new Messiah, this new king of, of the Jews. 
and they were using this symbol to, yes, um, celebrate and interpret this is the Messiah coming. So the palm branches were, would be representing the Messiah who came in military might to come to a city and to basically uh, overrun it and rule it and kick out the, the Gentiles to come and rule and reign their way. But my question is then, what symbol did Jesus use? Jesus didn't use palm branches, obviously the people did. Jesus had a particular symbol that he was able to use to remind the people of who he was. And it wasn't a war horse. Jesus uses a donkey, which was prophesied before uh, as well. Jesus used a donkey. Most military kings and military leaders would have rode in a chariot or on a war horse entering a city. But Jesus uses a donkey to symbolize his peace and his meekness. The symbolization, uh, symbolism of a, symbolization, is that a word? <laughs> the symbolism of a donkey, it refers to the, e uh, the Eastern tradition uh, that, is, that a donkey is the animal of peace, unlike a war horse, which is the animal for a war. A king would have ridden on a horse when he was bent on war, but would have ridden on a donkey to symbolize his arrival of peace. So Jesus is saying something here. Now my question to you is, uh, those of you that have uh, traveled the States or traveled uh, Europe in different ways, how many statues do you see around the world of kings on donkeys? No, they're, they're mainly, on, it, it's on horses to show power, to show might. Um, it's usually uh, a dude on a horse that we've erected a statue of to commemorate because he has won the victory for us. But who is this King Jesus? And what might he be up to? You see, the people picked up their palm branches expecting a military victory. But our king rejected the way of violence by riding on a donkey. Let me repeat that. This is coming from Isa Macaulay. The people picked up their palm branches expecting a military victory, but our king rejected the way of violence by riding on a donkey. What are you expecting, King Jesus, to act out? What are you expecting? Who who do you expect Jesus to be? Um, Isa Macaulay uh, goes on to say this, we pick up our palm branches and raise our shouts of support of the Jesus we've created in our minds, not the crucified Messiah, whose rule is rooted and grounded in love. He has become a rallying cry for our agenda, not his. And what Esau is, is uh, confronting us to think about right now is our view of who God is directly relates to how we then relate to others. Would we be reminded of a God who's come not in violence, but has come in self-sacrificial love, that has come for the way of peace, that has come to lay down his life, not to, uh, not to take others, has come from the house of misery, from the house of the poor, that is ready to bring good things to those on the margins, which, is, which ends up being good things for all people. Um, I want to say one more um, yeah, I'm going to read one more uh, quote 
from, from Esau. He wrote an article in Christianity Today that caught my attention that's kind of shaped this sermon. Um, and you can read it yourself. Just Google Christianity Today and uh, Palm Branches. But I really for sure want to just cite him here. He says this, Jesus' claim to be the Messiah was not simply about a goal, God's rule over all things. He and the crowd agreed on that point. <laughs> so he's, I'll just interject my own thing. He's saying he is the Messiah. The crowd is saying we're the Messiah. And, you, and Jesus is going to rule. But it's how he rules. So I'll go on this quote. His earthly life and ministry were also about the means of accomplishing that goal, namely self-sacrificial love. Jesus gave us not only the gift of forgiveness flowing through his passion and resurrection, but also a way to follow. That way needs to inform our public and private lives. See, Palm Sunday, we are confronted with a king who comes not to wage war, but to bring peace. We are confronted with our own expectations of who God is, fully revealed in the person of Jesus. And we are left pondering, who is this king and what has he come for? On Good Friday, we're going to see this king and the full extent of who he is displayed on the cross, ultimately revealing the generous, self-sacrificial, enemy-loving grace poured out for the entire world. And that means you, and that means your neighbor, that means your friends, that means your enemies. And that should then, that love poured out to us, who receive it should then um, not only encourage us, not only fill us, but should then challenge us to go and do likewise. Um, so I leave you with this. Who is this king of love? Who is this king of love? And may you experience, maybe you need to know and understand a God who is anointed in the house of misery, anointed in the house of the poor, anointed in the place where you wouldn't think anointing would happen. I, friends, that's good news. And that out of misery, out of ashes, out of the dirt of the earth, God is now going to rule and reign. And ultimately, he's going to accomplish his purposes by dying on the cross. Yes, yes, losing, <laughs> dying on the cross, fighting death with the death, and ultimately on the resurrection that we're going to celebrate next Sunday, be able to say we're done with death. And now we can live in the midst of, uh, in the midst of the harshness of life, in the midst of the um, <sighs> the misery of life, in the midst of the poverty of life, we have a God that's with us and that will show us the way. Oh God, would, oh guys, would you be encouraged in that way? Would each of you be encouraged and challenged as well? Uh, I leave you with a song. Um, I'm hoping that it's a song by, um, it's called um, Bethany in the Morning, where it gives us hope. Um, that, that God is coming um, anointed from Bethany and that there is a time of rising uh, and that this king looks so utterly different than what we could ask or imagine. And that, friends, is good news. Peace to you.
Praise the Lord, blessed be, who brings comfort to the very least of you, in whose hands the journey is, joy surprising. From the east, with every morn, can you hear the voice that summons up a rising song? Lift your head, dry your eyes, time for rising. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, blessed be He, blessed be He, anointed in the house of misery. Friends, I hope that you are encouraged as well as challenged today. I'm going to leave us with this blessing or this benediction from Kate Bowler this week. Oh God, you are interrupting us with eternity once again. Open our hearts and our minds and eyes and ears to hear what you have to teach us on this Palm Sunday. Time is marked as one small donkey plods towards Jerusalem one with a face set like flint, feet almost grazing the ground, walks forward toward the eastering of all sorrow. Not in the power of horses and swift victory, but in small, steady steps toward the mystery that through suffering comes healing, through shame dignity is restored, and through the cross that powers are disarmed. And death, done away with forever. Blessed are those walking forward into the great small work that they do in hospitals, in homes, in grocery stores, classrooms, churches, cubicles, families, back alleys. And blessed are we joining the crowds, waving the palm branches to shout ourselves hoarse. Hosanna! Save us. Save our world. God have mercy. Christ have mercy. Spirit have mercy. Amen. Friends, as you ponder those, that question of who this Jesus is, this King is this week, um, I hope to see you here next week, either online at our Good Friday service or in person at our Easter service. Peace to you, friends. Would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. But this joy is mine. With